Today is the beginning of the Advent season. Advent is four Sundays leading up to Christmas. And it's a season that's been a tradition throughout church history that encourages us to prepare our hearts so that on Christmas Day we can be ready to truly celebrate the meaning of God's gift to us here Uh, in the Christmas season. And today also is the beginning of our new series, as you've heard several times already, Unwrapping Christmas. And um, this is going to continue right through the Advent season. Christmas is God's gift to a broken world. That's what Christmas is. And so you have access to a kingdom that is more powerful than any earthly kingdom. Do you know that? That you have access to a kingdom, it's more powerful than the European Union, it's more powerful than the United Nations, it's more powerful than Capitol Hill, it's more powerful than 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. You have access to a kingdom that is greater than any human organization on earth. Come on, repeat this after me, say, something powerful is coming my way. Come on, say that out loud, say, something powerful is coming my way. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, something powerful is coming your way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look at your other neighbor and say, other neighbor, something powerful is coming your way too. <laughs> you believe that? Christmas is about God releasing his kingdom in the earth. I want to go to Matthew chapter 2. One of the classic Christmas passages, there's several, but this is one of them. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 11, the New King James Version. We'll have the scriptures on the screen. We also, in our ICLV mobile app, which I recommend for you to download, it's free. We have our message notes. And try to put some extra references in there if you want to continue this study. I rarely get to share everything that I come across as I'm prepping for a message, so I try to put some of the references there in the notes that you can email to yourself and follow up with as well. Matthew chapter 2 Verse 1 through 11, the New King James Version, and it says this. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has, born, who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this, thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child, and when you found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they'd seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy, and when they had come into the house they saw that the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Lord, we thank you for your word. It is living and active. It is powerful, God. And we pray, Lord, that you would take this message, God, and you would customize it, personalize it, individualize it for each and every here. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that your word accomplishes that which it sets out to do. It will not return void in our lives if we receive it by faith. I thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. 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 I want to ask you this question. We talk about unwrapping Christmas. How do you unwrap gifts at Christmas time? Anybody enjoy gift exchange at Christmas time, right? This passage is actually part of the origin of the tradition of gift giving for Christmas because the wise men brought gifts to baby Jesus, right? What an awesome tradition for a birthday. On my birthday, I usually ask for gifts, right? But on Jesus' birthday, everybody else get gifts. They, that, that's great. What a great tradition, right? And, and so many of us in a few weeks, we're going to be unwrapping gifts. I want to ask you, how do you unwrap gifts? 
Do you just like voraciously just, just rip that thing open and you just want to get to what's in the gift and you just throw everything aside and there's just a big giant mess on the ground after all the gift exchange? Is that how you open gifts? That's okay. I'm not, I'm not moralizing any of this right here. I'm just asking. I'm just curious. All right? Or, or are you more of a kind of a preservation person? You kind of you delicately, you know, open the gift, right? And you kind of, you kind of just set the stuff aside, right? So you can, just, ooh, that's nice tissue paper. That's nice. All right, now I can get to the gift, right? Now I'm going to share something about our family. My wife was hesitant that, that you guys might judge us as being cheap, but I don't, I don't really care what you think. Um, we kinda, we're kind of preservationists when we open gifts, right? We, we'll save ribbon and use it again. We'll save the box underneath the paper and use it again. We'll save the gift bags, you know, and use them again. And, and, and you'll, if, if you see our house after the gift, my wife will be kind of laying out the tissue paper, kind of flattening. Anyone ever done this before? Flattening it out and we fold it up. And it works really good the next year, 12 months. You just put it in the garage in a box and it works really good the next year, right? Different ways you can open gifts, right? How many knows there's, there's no wrong way here, right? Not one is better than the other, right? The goal is to open the gift. The only wrong way to open a gift is to not open it at all to just let it sit there and to neglect it and to never receive what someone gave you. See, Christmas is God's gift to a broken world and we have to know how to unwrap it. You have to know how to open it. King Herod didn't know how to open it. As we'll learn here, not even the religious leaders of the time knew how to open the gift of Christmas, but the wise men did. And I wanna ask you the question this morning, do you? Do you know how to open God's gift of Christmas to a broken and hurting world? The wise men step onto the stage of human history forever in this passage by their journey to Bethlehem. It's part of our famous nativity scenes. I love the Christmas decor that comes about our culture at this time. I, I love seeing the nativity scenes in the neighborhoods in front of houses. I love that we're way far away from October 31st and all the horror movie scenes. And, and some houses have magically gone from horror movies to baby Jesus. And I don't really know what that's all about, but I'm glad we got here. I'm glad we got here. We got here, praise God. And, and the nativity scene is great. It's a great visual. There's a lot of theology that's taught in the nativity scene. There's a lot of theology you can memorize from the visual. You're reminded that Mary and Joseph had Jesus in a manger because in the nativity scene, you're reminded of the angels appearing to the shepherds in the field and the, sh the shepherds coming to see baby Jesus because in the nativity scene, you're reminded of the wise men who come to visit baby Jesus. Even if you look on the touch cards that we just passed out to you, you'll see a depiction of the nativity scene there on the touch cards. I, I love the nativity scene. I don't want to burst anyone's bubble. That, it didn't happen like that though. That's not how it happened if you actually understand the, the, the biblical narrative. The Bible never says that there were three wise men. Do you know that? It doesn't say there were three wise men. It says there were three gifts. We don't actually know how many wise men were in the caravan that came to Jerusalem and ultimately Bethlehem. Uh, the Bible doesn't say they were kings. It, it, it doesn't say that they were kings. It says that they were magi, which can be translated wise men or astrologers. There's, there's different synonyms for this word, but it's, 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 they didn't say that they were kings. And the Bible doesn't say that they were there with the shepherds on the night Jesus was born. They were actually there months, months after Jesus was born. Did you know that? Anywhere from six months to two years, we don't know exactly, six months to two years after Jesus was born, the Magi showed up to Jerusalem looking for baby Jesus. We three kings of Orient are... That's heresy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, to, but, but I'm, it's, it's okay. The song's okay. It's okay to sing the song. It's okay. You're not, you're not doing anything bad. But it's actually not accurate in the Bible text. Wise men or magi is language lifted right out of Daniel chapter 2 from Babylon. If you go back and read Daniel 2, you'll see this language multiple times throughout the chapter. Daniel was actually chief of the wise men at his time in Babylon hundreds of years before. And the Bible says that they saw his star in the sky. 
that they were paying attention to the stars. Another translation of the word magi is the word astrologer, right? So they saw his star in the sky. And we also know this from history, that documented astrology, astrology goes way back, but documented astrology actually began in Babylon. It began in Babylon. And then we also know because of the, the diaspora, the dispersion of the Jews when, when Assyria conquered Israel and Babylon conquered Judah and they were carried away captive to Babylon, the great dispersion of the Jewish people, we know that, that the Jewish theology and the Jewish prophecy, we know that it had influence in Babylon because of the diaspora that happened through exile and captivity. And so the wise men see this mysterious star in the sky. And most likely, it was supernatural. And I'm going to show you why most likely it was supernatural in origin. A lot of different theories out there about the star. But most likely, this was a supernatural occurrence that these these diligent, attentive astrologers, it caught their attention and made them curious. But these Persian men, they left on a long distance journey looking for a newborn king of the Jews. They said, where is the king of the Jews who's been born when they arrived in Jerusalem? And this all happens at an interesting moment in history and the world power structure. Because Babylon was no longer a world power like they used to be. At one time, Babylon was the most powerful nation in the earth, which can give you a lot of national pride. It can make you proud to be a a Babylonian, right? Because you're the most powerful nation in the earth. I'm sure we know nothing about that here in our country. But it can give you a lot of national pride if you're not sure about that. At the time, Rome, Rome was now the major world power in the earth. Babylon wasn't a part of Rome. Babylon was now a part of the Parthian Empire at the time that the wise men are making their journey in Matthew chapter 2. Babylon is nowhere close to the same level of significance compared to their past political uh, financial, economic, and military power that they once had. They're, They're not at that same place of influence. And that's where these guys are coming from. That's the backdrop of their history that they're coming from. Rome is in charge. Rome is in charge, and they are tyrants, and they are oppressive. There's a lot of destabilization in the Roman government. We're not too far removed. We're at Caesar Augustus at this point, but we're not too far removed from Julius Caesar, who gets stabbed in the back and removed from power by being killed. Et tu, Brute? This is what is not that far away from this time period. And so these wealthy, educated men, they humbly seek out this new king of the Jews. They didn't care if he was Persian. That that, that pride was no longer an issue. They were so dissatisfied with the current political power structure that they had to go see if this was the new king that was prophesied by the Jews because it was a world of chaos back then, I'm talking. It was a world of chaos. It was a world of confusion. It was a world of conflict back then, I'm talking. Sound familiar? I mean, right now we have Russia at war in Ukraine, right? Right now Israel is under attack and at war. Our world is doing its own thing right now. And so is our country right here. And so is Las Vegas right here. If you don't believe me, go down to Fremont Street on Friday night. You can see us doing our own thing. Take my word for it. Don't go down there on a Friday night, but have it your way, however you want to do it. Our society right now is telling young people that they're born in the wrong body. Our democracy is divided. The big C church, not this church, the big C church across our country is divided. Side note, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He didn't say, I will deconstruct my church and then you'll have revival. He didn't say, I will deconstruct my church and then everything will be great. But there's so much negativity and so much scrutiny. I just wanna, I wanna step into all the all the negative naysayers of Christianity today. I just wanna step in and just, just take on my Dr. Phil impersonation and go, say, how's that working for you? No, Jesus said, I will build my church. It was a chaotic, confusing, and conflicted world at that time and now. 
This is why it's important for us to unwrap Christmas wisely. Wisely. We want to unwrap Christmas like the wise men did at that time. Christmas is God's gift to a broken world then and now. Christmas is God's gift of a just and powerful king to a chaotic world then and now. And like the Magi, you have to know how to open God's gift. So in the few minutes we have together here, I want to share with you a couple points on unwrapping Christmas wisely. Number one is this. Pay attention, don't seek attention. Pay attention, don't seek attention. Maybe some of you are going to go to a restaurant after this service, or maybe at some point this week you're going to be at a restaurant. And maybe if you remember this sermon, if you're falling asleep right now, you won't. But if you're paying attention right now, you remember this sermon. Maybe you take a moment and just do, just kind of canvas the restaurant with your eyes. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to find a high percentage, maybe over half the people in the restaurant, they're going to be with other people dining like this. Like this. Oh, man, I got a bill that's over. Okay. Anyways, um, notifications are great. Uh, but you, you sit there and people are looking at their phones. If you, it, I think of an outdoor cafe. I think of people eating at an outdoor cafe. And, man, if Jesus reappeared in the eastern sky in fulfillment of New Testament prophecy, I think the whole cafe would miss it because everyone's like this in their phone. People are not paying attention. But when the wise men came to Jerusalem, they said, we have seen his star. We've been paying attention, and we've been curious, and we have seen his star. Again, most likely it was supernatural. There's all kinds of uh, theories out there that try to give a natural explanation to the star that the wise men saw. And then with every theory that's out there, there are 10 debunkers waiting to, to tear that theory down. I'm going to show you in, later on in the verse what was most not likely supernatural. But here's the thing. Back then, back then, astrology was seen as a means to predict the future. We have modern versions of this today, uh, a.k.a. horoscopes. Did I say that right? Is that the right way to say it? Horoscopes? I can't remember. I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it is what I'm trying to say, right? The Bible calls that divination. It's condemned actually in scripture. I don't want to know the future according to the stars. I want to know the one who holds the stars. I want to know the future from him. That's what I want to know. And so they're, they're studying the sky and the star appears in their astrology. Eventually, I'm going to show you here, it, it causes them to pivot into theology. I mentioned the Jewish influence that was present in Babylon. As they see this star, they begin to ask themselves, what meaneth this? That's a, that's a common uh, phrase I ask myself in King James language when something's going on. I go, Lord, what meaneth this? Right? What meaneth this? And they're saying, what does this mean? And they're searching different philosophies and different backgrounds, and they come across uh, their access to, to Jewish philosophy and Jewish prophecy, and they come across something that's known as the star prophecy. Repeat that to me. Say the star prophecy. This is in Numbers 24, verse 17, and this is what it says. It was from the prophet Balaam. He said, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near saying that this is something in the future. He says, a star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. This was known as the star prophecy in the time of Matthew chapter 2 as well. Remember that in Jewish philosophy, the stars were the descendants of Abraham and Isaac. Not literally, but figuratively, God had spoken to Abraham and spoken to Isaac and said, I will multiply your descendants. They will be like the stars in the sky. But in the star prophecy, there was one announced, this is the star of all stars. This is someone greater than Moses, greater than Elijah, greater than David, greater than all the prophets, priests, and judges put together. This is the star, the Messiah. And there shall be a scepter in his hand because he's not just a spiritual leader. He's going to rule the world. 
He's going to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he's going to come out of Israel, not just a king to Israel, a king from Israel for the entire world. Again, this was from the prophet Balaam, who had a very mixed background. If you study his character in scripture, there's a lot of pros and cons to the character of Balaam. But did you know this, that Balaam was from the east? He was an Aramean, and Arameans eventually moved to Babylon. So the wise men would have been familiar with Balaam as well as him, with him being from that area. And so seeing this sign in the sky and doing some research, paying attention, they come to the conclusion that this must be, this is, this is the Messiah, but is this really the time? Is this the time? And, and there was this guy in Babylon, his name was Daniel. He was from Babylon. He lived there. He was the second most powerful guy in Persia at one point, and they have all of his writings. They go back and they study Daniel, and Daniel has this image of a soldier, and, and he predicts four different kingdoms that are going to come to pass, and, and the guys are doing their human history, and they go, man, we're on the fourth kingdom. Babylon has come and gone as the most powerful kingdom. Persia has come and gone as the most powerful kingdom. Greece has come and gone as the most powerful kingdom. And now we're here at Rome. We're in the fourth kingdom. We're four out of four. And then they go to Daniel chapter 9 and they look at Daniel's 70-week prophecy. It's 70 weeks each week representing seven years, 490 years. And the prophecy says that the timing begins once the nation of Israel returns back to the homeland out of exile. And they do the math and they go, wow, that only happened 450 years ago. We're almost all the way through Daniel's 70 weeks. They were paying attention. They're going, this is the sign and the time is now. The Messiah has been born. We need to pack our bags and go. I want to ask you this question. If you don't understand everything I just said, just go back and research it. I promise you, it all holds up true. Are you paying attention now? Are you paying attention now because the signs are being laid out by God for the time that we live in right now? It says, Jesus said in Matthew 24, he says, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send his angels with a great sound of trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the earth to the other. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. This is all the words of Jesus. When, a, when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Are you paying attention? Did you know when Israel became a country again, it was a fulfillment of prophecy? Did you know it was the fulfillment that the times of the Gentiles were over? Are you paying attention to what's happening right now? The signs are laid out, but today people are more worried about how many followers they have online than they are about following Jesus. And if you want to unwrap Christmas, you got to start paying attention to what's going on around you. Number two, search for God and seek after him this Christmas. You got to pay attention, not seek attention, and you got to search for God and seek after him this Christmas. I know you're searching for sales right now. I understand it. It's real. I get it. That's okay. Just seek Jesus and search for Jesus a little bit more than the sales, okay? One person said amen. I'll take that. Okay. I got it. I know. The struggle's real, pastor. I know. It's interesting that they refer to them as wise men. Proverbs is the book of wisdom. And often the practices of the wise are contrasted with the practices of the foolish throughout the book of Proverbs. For example, Proverbs 2, 4, and 5 says, If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Searching and seeking are listed as virtuous activities unto God in Proverbs. And the text, Matthew 2, 3 through 8, King Herod is troubled. They come to Jerusalem. They say, we're here to see uh, the new king of the Jews that's been born. And the current king, Herod, goes, uh, excuse me, could you say that again? What was that? There, there's a new king other than me? What? Could you repeat that, please? And he was troubled. He was troubled because King Herod was set up out of a political deal that he cut with Caesar in Rome. 
He wasn't really of the line of David. He really wasn't from the tribe of Judah. He knew he wasn't really supposed to be king of the Jews. Excuse me, there's been a new king that's been born? The Bible says King Herod was troubled, but here's one of the most underrated verses in all of Scripture. If you have your Bibles and a pen, this would be a good one to underline. If you have your digital uh, screen, you can highlight it there. It says, and all of Jerusalem. King Herod was troubled, but it says this, all of Jerusalem was troubled by the news of the Magi asking about where the new king of the Jews had been born. Here's the thing, if you understand the timing, this probably wasn't the first time they heard it. Remember, this is months down the road. They didn't show up the night Jesus was born. They showed up maybe a year, year and a half to two years later. And so we know that when Jesus was born, his parents brought him into the temple to be dedicated. And there was a just and devout man named Simeon who, was, who, who had a revelation that before he died, he was going to see the Messiah. And there was Anna the prophetess who was waiting diligently for the consolation of Israel in the form of the Messiah. And they're there in the temple today, Jesus being dedicated as a baby. And they say, the Messiah has come. He is going to be responsible for the rise and fall of many in Israel. And they declare that he is the Messiah. This happened months before the Magi come to Jerusalem and announced where is the new king of the Jews that's been born? Say, so why are you telling us all this? Because Herod goes to the religious leaders and says, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? And they give him a 700-year-old prophecy that is 100% accurate. He, they give him Micah 5, 2, and 3. Oh, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, out of you shall come a ruler. 700 years before Christ was born. Anybody want to do a friendly wager? Anyone want to, want to place a bet if you could guess where the next president of the United States 700 years from now is going to be born? Anybody want to do that? No, no takers? That's good. You're not, that means you're not gamblers. Okay, praise God. Praise God. You're following Jesus. That's good. That's good. Get off a of DraftKings app. Get off a of DraftKings app. Okay, good. Focus, focus, focus. No, it would be impossible. And yet they knew they actually had the right info. They actually give it to them and actually helps them find Jesus where Jesus was born. But here's the thing. None of them go with them. (laughs) King Herod doesn't go with them. The religious leaders who know the fulfillment of the prophecy, they don't go with them. Hey, we believe the, uh, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Messiah that's been prophesied about for thousands of years has been born. Can you guys tell us where it is? Yeah, it's in Bethlehem. Go, go, go check it out for us and let us know what happens. Huh? What? There's no text messaging. There's no like, hey, we, we, you guys were right. Come and check it out. There's no email. There's no telephone. There's no Facebook. There's no phone book. There's nothing. Yeah, go check it out and let us know. Not too important on the priority list. And it it gives me the fear of God as a pastor that I could have holy knowledge and actually share it with somebody and just go back and stick my nose in the book and think I'm spiritual. Because that's what they did. Yeah, yeah, if the Messiah is here, he's in Bethlehem. You guys go check it out. What? And I gotta I gotta ask myself, where would I be in that situation? Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. They missed their hour of visitation. Don't miss his visitation in your life this Christmas. Seek him during this Advent season. Seek him in his word. Seek him in in, in obedience and holy living. Seek him in worship like the Magi who bowed down before Jesus as a baby. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 2, he says, I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in ways who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts. He said this in Isaiah in the Old Testament, I stretch out my hands all day long. I love it because it's a prophetic picture of the cross. It's a prophetic picture of Jesus' outstretched arms on the cross, saying, my arms are open to receive you. 
Seek the Lord while he may be found, while he's still near. He's stretching out his arms to you today. He's still available today. He's still offering the finished work of the cross and eternal life to you today. The first time Jesus came, during that first Christmas, he came to us as the sacrificial lamb of God. The next time, he will return to us as the lion of Judah. The first time Jesus came as the suffering servant, the next time Jesus will return as a victorious conqueror. Jesus is returning soon. The signs are out there, but I still have to ask myself, am I responding like the Magi responded? Am I searching for God and seeking him? Do I have a daily, active, vibrant relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ? So we need to unwrap Christmas by paying attention, not seeking attention, by searching for God and seeking him this Christmas. And number three, you have to discover your need for the one true king. You got to discover your need for the one true king. You ever been done with something? You ever been disappointed multiple times that you were just done, right? Gone to the restaurant for, for the umpteenth time, had a bad experience. I'm never going to that restaurant again, right? That sports team lets you down for the, I'm not, I'm done rooting for this team. I give up. The season's over. I'm done watching it for the rest of the season. How about a boss, right? Ever been done with a boss? Church staff, stay quiet right now. Okay, so ever been in that position where you're just done? <laughs> the Magi were done with all the earthly kings and power structures. They wanted something more. They were ready for something new. That's why the Bible says in Matthew 2, 11, that when they came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and worshiped him. They bowed down low and they worshiped their new king. They desperately wanted a new kingdom. They desperately were hopeful for something new. And although... People had the wrong idea of the time of the Messiah. They, they thought Jesus was coming to set up an actual kingdom in the earth. Jesus came to start building an invisible kingdom, which we're still building to this day, thousands of years later. But he will eventually come to establish his kingdom in the earth. And the Bible calls this the millennial kingdom after his second coming. And the Bible gives us passages. I was just reading one this week in Psalms 10. I thought, oh, this works perfect with the message, Lord. Psalms 10, verse 16 through 18 says, the Lord is king forever and ever. The Lord is king forever and ever. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the rich and greedy. No, that's not what it says. So that's how, that's how government in 2023 works. It's not what it says. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. Oh, this is the kind of kingdom that mankind craves. This is what the wise men were seeking out. It's 180 degrees opposite of human government and corruption. This is what the king says to us in John 7.37. If you have a red letter Bible, these letters are in red because they're the words of Jesus. It says, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, if anyone thirsts, is that if anyone is dissatisfied, if anybody wants more, let him come to me and drink. I alone am your king that can bring satisfaction. This is the invitation from the one true king. Come to me, sons and daughters. Look to me. I am the desire of the nations. See, Herod didn't want a new king. That's the last thing Herod wanted. Herod wanted to be king. Herod was one of the most insecure tyrants we know in human history. Herod killed people in his own family because he was concerned that they were going to usurp him. The last thing he wanted was the new Messiah king who was born of the Jews. 
This is why we know that the, the wise men came 18 months to two years later, somewhere later down the line, because after, afterwards the wise men visit Jesus, and then they never go back. They're warned in a dream not to go back. And Herod realizes he's been duped. They're not coming back to tell him what happened. And so he gives an order to go out and kill all the males that were born two years and under. He didn't want a new king in his life. Herod wanted to be king. Herod was the original Grinch who tried to steal Christmas. Listen, being your own king is exhausting. Being in charge of me is too much for me. I don't want to be king over me. I'm so thankful this isn't my church. I'm so thankful I'm not king of this church. I'm so thankful Jesus is king of ICLV. And you should be thankful too. You should be thankful Jesus is king too. You'd be in a whole mess of trouble if it was on me. I can tell you from personal experience, it's not all on me. If it was all on me, we'd be in much worse shape right now. Jesus is so good. Jesus is so faithful. Jesus is so full of grace and mercy and power. He's so good. He's a good master. He's a good Lord. He's the one true king. He is the desire of the nations. Who is king in your life? Worship team, please come back to the stage. Thank you. Who is king of your marriage? Is it you? Who is king of your social life on Friday night in Las Vegas? Who is king? Who is king of your career? Who is king of your finances? Who is king of your calling? Is it Jesus or are you still in an arm wrestling match or trying to be king in your life? Oh, man, I don't know about you. I want Jesus to be king. I want Jesus to be king. Does anybody want Jesus to be king this morning? Come on, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, they saw his star, and it was a sign to them. And remember I said it was probably supernatural because if you go back and you really slow down and read the passage, they come to Jerusalem, the star is gone. The star stirred their curiosity and got them moving. They go to Jerusalem. They say, where is the king of the Jews who's been born? And they get the direction to go to Bethlehem. The Bible says this. The Bible says, as they started to go from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, the star appears again. And they begin to rejoice. And the star, it, it begins to move, not just over Bethlehem. It moves and comes right over the house where Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus are. It was supernatural. Revelation twenty two sixteen. 16, Jesus says, I am the bright and the morning star. Jesus is the star. He's the star of stars. He's the fulfillment of the star prophecy. And look at first, uh, second Peter 1, 18. It says, so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The star of Bethlehem wasn't meant to just stay in Matthew chapter two. The star of Bethlehem was meant to go from Matthew chapter two right into your heart. And the Lord wants the star of Bethlehem to rise again this Christmas, but this time he wants it to rise in your heart. This was the sign to them that God was giving them to lead them. And I believe God continues to give us signs of his love and his mercy. I came across this, you know, in 1990, they launched the Hubble Space Telescope out into the depths of space. And it, it goes out and it, it takes pictures and it, it beams them back to Earth so we can see what's out there. They've launched uh, other things since then. But in 1992, 
it beamed back an image from the Whirlpool Galaxy. The scientists refer to it as the X structure, but I see it differently. I see a reminder from our God of how much he loves us. They took this from 23.16 million light years away from the earth, and this is what they found out in the depths of space. This is what came back to earth. It was God reminding us, this is how much I love you. This is what I did for you. You don't have to walk in shame. You don't have to walk in pain. You don't, walk to, you don't have to walk in the, the tragedy of the past. I love you this much. And I didn't come to judge you and condemn you. I came to be your substitution. I came to pay the price. I came to forgive you. I came to heal you. I came to fill you. That's how much he loves you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, close your eyes this morning, church. Close your eyes. Lord, I thank you for your presence that's here, God. And I thank you it's not an accident that each and every person is here, Lord God. I believe everybody here under the sound of my voice in person and online, Lord, I believe it's a divine appointment, God. We have prayed for this moment, Lord God. And Lord, there are people here today, Lord, it is their moment, God. If they were to be honest, Lord God, they would admit you have not been king of their life in this season. But Lord, you brought them here, God, to extend your love and your grace and your mercy again. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved for it is with your, is with your heart that you believe and are justified and with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Jesus is here. And before we dismiss, I don't want to leave anything to chance. If you need to get right with God this morning, if you need to make Jesus king of your life, if you need to ask him to forgive you of your sins this morning, if you want to know that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, before you leave this morning, I would ask for the privilege and the honor of praying for you. I don't want to leave anything to chance. It's too important. And so with every eye closed, with every Christian brain in this place, I'm gonna count to three. And when I get to three, if you need to come back to God, if you need to invite Jesus to be king of your life again, when I get to three, I want you to slip up a hand. Come on with every Christian praying in this place. The Holy Spirit is knocking on the door of your heart. One, you need to get right with God this morning. Two, maybe you once had faith in, in God but it's wavered of late. Three, I want you to lift up a hand right now. Come on, yes, I see that hand in the back. Yes, yes, over here on my right. Anybody else, you need to receive Jesus. Yes, over here on my left. Yes, over here on my far left. Yes, in the back. Yes, yes, come on, there's hands going up. Come on, this is your time. Lift your hand up high. Let Jesus see it. Let him see it. I wanna pray with you right now. The worship team's gonna begin to play in a moment. As they begin to play, I want you to not, don't look around to the left or right. I want you to step out of your seat and come down right here and we're gonna pray in a moment. Come on, go ahead. Lead us team, lead us team, come down, come down.
one more time, one more time. Come on. There's a few more. Don't hesitate. Don't procrastinate. Turn to someone next to you. Say, if you need to go, I'll go with you. Come on. Just close your eyes. Just close your eyes up front here. Jesus is here. The Bible says if you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. Come on, they're still coming. Come on, the, the water's good. You can jump in. The water's good. Come on down. And we're going to say a prayer together in concert. There's no magic in the words. You just need to say them with a heart of childlike faith. I just want to make sure, is everyone here? I still see motion. Is anybody else? Come on, this is your moment. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, come on, come on, come on. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. ICLV, are you excited this morning? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to repeat this prayer together with every eye closed. Just close your eyes right now. Repeat this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me and rising from the grave. Forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me of my sins. I turn from my old life. And I want to follow you from this moment on and the rest of my days. Jesus, you are my king. And nobody else is. You and you alone. In Jesus' mighty name. Now just keep your eyes closed. I want to pray over you right now. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that they are a part of your kingdom. I thank you, Lord, that the kingdom of God is peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for healing. I thank you, Lord, for freedom, God, from addiction and from depression. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for a new relationship with you, Lord. I thank you for fresh power to pray. Fresh power to praise, Lord God. Fresh revelation, Lord God, of who you've called them to be. You had each and every one of their days written down in your book before they were ever born. And Lord, you've been waiting for this moment, Jesus. You've been waiting to have this communion with them. And we bless it right now, Lord God. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we bless them, Lord. And we say they are your sons and your daughters. And nothing can separate them from your love. In the name of Jesus, we pray all these things. And everybody said, amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. Now here's what we're going to do. If I could pray with each and every one of you, I would. But it would, we'd be here for two hours. We want to pray with each and every one of you individually. And altar team staff, if you're not up here, I hope we have one person behind everybody here. We have leaders that are behind you. If you do this, you just turn to your side. We have a leader behind you right now. We want to pray with you personally before you leave and share some resources with you. We love you and we're excited for you. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Church, how many believe that God wants to do something in this hour? How many believe there's a hunger for Jesus in this hour and that there's a harvest that the Lord wants to bring in? Lord, we go out today. Lord, give us divine appointments, God. Give us open doors, Lord Jesus. Let us be salt and light in a lost and hurting world. And we're going to see miracles in the month of December. We're going to see miracles in the month of December. We're going to see miracles in the month of December for your glory, Lord. For your glory, Lord. In Jesus' powerful name. Amen. 
Amen. Church, if you need prayer for anything, we'll be up here. But we bless you. Have a great day. Have a blessed week. Hey, thanks again for checking out ICLB here on YouTube. Hope you're already subscribed, getting notifications. Make sure you're following us on all our social media channels. Download our mobile app and check us out Sundays, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., online, in person. We want to see you there. God bless.